fluffy bread, classic burger buns, and so many carbs. Carb fear is real. But Hero Bread makes healthier versions of the carb-heavy favorites we love most. We're talking fewer calories, zero to two grams net carbs, zero sugar, and seriously great taste. Plus, more of the dietary fiber and protein you want with no compromise. Don't skip out on your favorites. Just use Hero Bread. Get 10% off your order at hero.co with code HEROPOD at checkout. I walk a straight line, shackle and chain. Oh, Goose and Gertie is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hill String Gang, Rango. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Bloody Angola, a <laughs> podcast 142 years in the making. Complete story, America's bloodiest prison. And I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Everton. And we're back we're after back. a little week. Back, back, you know, back. we had Easter. And um, that's the first time, I think, taking off with the show since we started it. Yeah. Maybe a Christmas or somewhere. With a re- I know replay. we put them out like uh, hotcakes. Hotcakes. And uh, uh, put them out and do it consistent. But y'all, um, yeah, I hope you had a happy Easter with your families. And, yeah, it was a beautiful day and all that. And um, it's time to get down to some bloody Angola again. Yeah. And this it- is one of the most famous people that ever came out of Angola. Yeah, he really is, and the amazing thing to me is, is uh, unless you're a, a music fan of jazz music and things like that, you may or may not be aware of the story, yeah, but the he blues. is, in fact, the blues, if not yeah. the the most famous uh, prisoner to ever come out of Angola. And his story is amazing, so we're we're going to tell you about him today, and that is he's known as Lead Belly. Yep. Uh, and we'll get into kind of why, but I'm going to take y'all back a little bit and we're going to go to 1934 y'all a minute ago. Now a little bit, um, a little minute ago. And this was uh smack dab in the middle of the great depression. Mm-hmm. Now, bloody Angola at that time had about 3000 inmates housed there. It's uh, if you'll remember and, and, Past stories we've told you they were in ramshackle camps basically, and they right. were they were on that sprawling eighteen thousand acres. And convict guards and that's right, a whole different whole, time. whole different time, and they were removed from the effects of the depression because hell, let's face it, they were pretty much in depression type con- right, right. conditions, whether no, there was I mean, a depression or not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, the Great Depression started in nineteen twenty nine. And it didn't end until many years later. So they're smack dab in the middle of that. Now, at that time, 90 employees guarded them. And they used, you know, force. As Woody just mentioned, they had shot, shotgun-toting convict guards. Right, right. And they would lock them up at night. And they, there was no, you know, sergeants on the dorms and all that back then. And they, they, they pushed them on the line in the field during the day and locked them up at nighttime to their own devices. <laughs> That's right. And prison foremans. At that time, they called him captain or boss. Right, right. Uh, prisoners were, believe it or not, back then they called prisoners old things. Yeah, that's what they called them. Things. 
And uh, no one was really spared when it came to punishment in Angola during that time. Now, also at this time, 130 female convicts were still housed at Camp D. And they worked in the fields along with the men at that time and floggings at that time. Mm -hmm. Commonplace. Hot boxes. Yeah, yeah, we told you about that before. Uh, This, you know certain amount of lashes for certain things and they'd have other convicts hold them down while yeah. they while they whooped them yeah. yeah and remember we talked about the fields where they put yeah. them in those hot boxes yeah. and they would open Imagine them the next day they'd be sitting in the field and then it's 111 degrees outside and they put you in a tin box <laughs> yeah and now it's 150 yeah, at least yeah so harsh conditions and at that time, prisoners died at a rate of 41 per year yep. in 1934. Yeah, almost one a week. Yeah. Money during that time uh, was appropriated to the prison uh, and prison officials. You know, there was rumors they were diverting yeah. <laughs> some of that money. Right. Uh, whether that's true or not, we don't know. But the daily menu at that time was grits, sweet potatoes, black strap syrup. Yes, How about indeed. that? You ever had black strap syrup, Woody? I have. I had the the homemade dark cane syrup. Yeah, like that's what basically what they're talking about. Yeah. Yep. Yep, and every single day, all the food obviously grown, yeah, uh, and served so on England. whatever money they got appropriated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they were raising their own shit. <laughs> they were raising their own shit. The men at that time wore white twelve ounce uniforms sewn by the female convicts, and they would chafe them raw in the scorching Louisiana heat. Yeah. They wore black, hard soled, heavy shoes made on Angola by the Camp East. Uh, shoe shop mm-hmm. and they were issued straw farm hats mm-hmm. nothing else That's no it. underwear no no socks yep. they didn't even have a belt to keep their pants up yeah I mean, that's crazy uh now this is just one year y'all since charlie frazier who we told you about and several other convicts from camp e escaped angola right. and the reason they developed the red the red hat cell block yep the, the very reason, and there were no visitors allowed in Angola since that escape until 1937. So they went that. several years. No, uh, that's a, a lot. I don't, don't imagine many people back then got visitors anyway. Yeah. Because that old road back then, uh, in the 30s, it had to be gravel. And yeah. It took, you know, once you turned off a of, off of uh, 61, it should have taken an hour to get up there, or two hours, yeah. if you're going by horse. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Good point. And uh, so no visitors were typically allowed. However, a musical historian by the name of John Lomax, mm. he was allowed into Angola in 1934. Now, he was the curator of the Archive of American Folk Songs, and he requested uh, the visit to track down Southern folk music and tour the prison. He was just looking for prison related work songs, yeah. like we used to have as our intro. Right, right, right. right. Well, that's exactly. well, not ago. only that, for um, when the original Real Life Real Crime, the very first one I found was the prison chain gang song. I don't want to grab my coffee. Yeah, so I love that one. song. But the thing, this trips me out. They think about that in the thirties. Now, that's not like they had phones that recorded. Or mm-hmm. boom boxes or tape recorders. This was some old school shit. Yeah, and, this was uh, school. to go out and record it. Yeah. And it was the only thing that made the day pass. Right. I mean, those chain gangs uh, were singing because it just you know it all you them. have to focus on is work. Yeah, it helped them uh, keep the rhythm. Like if there's sling blade or whatever, yep. everybody you know, they, you know they do it on a certain beat on the upswing, certain beat on downswing. It helps them keep the same rhythm. That way nobody's going faster and nobody's slacking fucking off and going slower. Yeah. Uh, so the music helped them, you know, pass the day, but more importantly, helped them stay in rhyme with the cutting or whatever work they're doing. It's yeah. Like, very good point. Uh, kind of like a military cadence when you left, you left, you left, yep. right, left. But it's the same thing when they're singing the songs. Very good. Uh, now, so he's he goes to visit, and they allow him to for that reason. But at Camp A, he came across more than just songs. He found a black singer guitarist, and this guy actually blew him away, and a lot of other people later on. Absolutely. And then, so Magic went up there, 
I mean, you know, I had to slip the warden a 20 or something and say, hey, can I have access? And this is what I'm looking for. And it's not a whole lot of really incentive for the warden and, and the people to just, you know, this guy's not a celebrity. Right. You know, or, yeah, he's um, a music shit, The radio story. hadn't even been, been around for that fucking long. Uh, uh, but so however he got access, to, he got the access and quickly became known, to, you know, the – Hottest thing going at Angola was a guy by the uh, the name of Huddy Ledbetter, but the convicts called him Lead Belly, and he's a big dude. He was six feet tall, but not an ounce of fat, y'all. He had that prison, prison muscle, muscle. We're about. Oh, yeah. and you could only get that. You can't do steroids and get that kind of muscles, right? Yeah. So um, no one could say for sure how old Lead Belly was exactly at this initial meeting and it's it's guesstimated he was around 45 years old y'all and even lead belly didn't know his own age um he was born on a plantation and his parents were both ex-slaves so put it in a context we're talking civil war ended in 1865 75 85 95 1965 you're talking about 40 50 years later yeah after at the end of the civil war right yeah. so you have, um his parents were both ex-slaves. When he was five years old, his family moved to Texas to work for a black plantation owner named Henry Sims. So let's go back to it again. Look, when uh, Lincoln emancipated the slaves and all that and the Civil War ended during Reconstruction whatever, hey, you still had the plantations. Yeah. And the world still had this need for cotton and all these different uh, items that they do. But the... Just because the slaves were free, you know, they still had, they still worked, they right. still needed to eat, yeah, and and, and so yeah, they, you couldn't they, just they, say we're right. free and not make them so, money. So they continued, even though they were ex slaves, it was most of them. Now I'd say eighty percent stayed on these plantations and worked anyway. It's what they knew how to do, right? Yeah, and generational, right? So it's, he he goes, I mean, they moves to Texas, and and they're working for Henry Sims, and they saved money. And eventually, Leadbelly's um, dad purchased uh, 68 wooded acres of land close to Shreveport, Louisiana, y'all. And there, yeah, I'm guessing if you listen to this, you know what? That's in the far northwestern corner of the state. But get this, y'all. He bought that land, 68 acres. For two dollars and fifty cents per acre. That's it. I mean, you can't get an acre for and it. Yeah, it, I mean, we that's a lot of money back the then. Though, on the Mississippi, imagine. Louisiana line, yeah, that was in the middle of nowhere, no road fronts or whatever, and they want sixty five hundred acre for it. Yeah, that was a lot of money back then. Though. You're right. So, and and obviously they probably saved that money for. Yeah, I mean they they might have been making two dollars and fifty cents a day. And they know. didn't have it in a savings account. It was a better as an old tin can oh, or yeah. hidden under a mattress or something. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a lot of hard work. But his and you're right. His dad chopped trees, and his mom cleared the br- the brush, and they built a home. And they turned it into their own working farm. Yeah. Right? Very so good. as a kid. Led Belly learned to play the guitar from his uncle, and he was a natural y'all, and he played well enough that word got around, and at 15 years old, he would play on Shreveport's Fannin Street, which was a really bad part of town, uh, filled with whorehouses and bars and just— Kind of like Bourbon Street. Kind of like time. Bourbon Street, yeah. but a whole lot more illegal, you know, yeah. back then. There wasn't the, the kind of policing and the shit that they have now. But 15 years old— He's out there. He's playing because he's making money. Sure. Right. And young. So, right. Right. So, in a, like you, you know, you can imagine, uh, yeah, being on Fannin Street it was not the best influence for for <laughs> uh, for him, right? Or especially as a, a young teenager. And he would uh, play each bar on down on Fannin Street for fifty cents. And all the alcohol he could drink. That sounds like a good right? deal. Like a good time. <laughs> At fifteen, yeah. And, but by the time he was sixteen, he was married and had a kid. Oh, right? look at how he lived better. He, he was he was making it happen it out, early. Right, fifteen years old. But he was a big kid. I mean, you know, you hit that puberty, uh, and you're running a fast and, life. And, right, right. I mean, and and like I said, that he got, you know, he's a pretty big dude. Yeah. So he, uh, by fifteen or sixteen, he would. 
he would have reached, you know, the end of his puberty. But so, um, you know, he, he kind of became famous. You know, I mean, his, his, his name got out there and his, he continued to rise, uh, um, in popularity. And he moved back to Texas where he met a blues singer and a guitarist by the name of Blind Lemon Jefferson. There you go. Right? Look, that's my favorite and, part right. of these historic well, this, stories. And so, Blind Lemon. Blind Lemon Jefferson took a shine to him. And they struck up a friendship and they would start performing together. Okay. Right? So, yeah. now you got Blind Lemon Jefferson, who was already famous in his own right, and Huddy Ledbetter. Uh, and, you know, Fairly quickly, uh, Ledbetter soon became known as the king of the twelve string guitar. Well, I'll be so the, the, I mean, so he had a natural talent. Obviously, he didn't go to the guitar school, right? Right. And, and, and now he's teamed up with a, a, a streetwise, um, another famous blues singer. And I mean, his fame just rose. Yeah. I mean, Married with kids. But as we mentioned, he's living pretty hard, pretty violent. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, and he had an attitude. He was a bigger guy. Didn't even, you know, even before he was in prison, he was built. And uh, he would fight pretty much at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's what, you know, y'all, he's not playing, you know, um, nice clubs. My daddy would always call them juke joints. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, you know, Juke joints, you know, back then there was there was a lot of disdain, if you will, for alcohol and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. it seemed they like everybody went to the bad side of town to the juke joints where where they were playing and drank whites and blacks and yeah. and, and drank and partied. But look, these there was no law, and, yeah. and, and if you looked at somebody the wrong way, almost like being in prison. They would fight and they would kill you. They'd cut you, shoot you. Saturday night special. That's where it came. The term came from was the little cheap ass pistols that they would use in the juke joints. Fights would break out and they would kill each other. And it was a throwaway gun. There you go. Well, he he was ready. He was down, as they say. Right. Uh, weapons are no weapons. He would fight either way. Uh, and most of his trouble, though, it came from jealous lovers and husbands. Because old Ledbetter was hot. Because old yeah. Ledbetter was running it. And, and he Look. made them women move. Yeah, with them man. Boy, they he played them down. blues. He, he mm-hmm. got them singing. Uh, so a lot of husbands would come after him, and he actually came close to uh, getting killed on many occasions. Now, one of these situations led Huddy to killing a man in 1918. And he was sent to Texas State Prison for that murder. Right. Now, he managed to survive, which that Texas prison, that was harsh. It was mm-hmm. not quite bloody Angola, but yeah. it was pretty close. Yeah. And it had a reputation, actually, for being a little bloody Angola, if you will, primarily due to uh, to his name in the blues community. His stardom led him to play for the Texas governor, a guy by the name of Pat Neff, right. in 1925. And it was that particular instance that led to Neff doing what? Issuing a pardon to Ledbetter right. just before leaving office to make Ledbetter a free man. So he gets out of prison even after killing a man, which at that time, you're lucky if you don't get strung up, right. you know, for that, which is what they did back in those days. Uh, but the prison stint, it didn't do a whole lot to calm down Huddy. And he ended up with three more dangerous altercations just a few years after his release from prison. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Coriant. Coriant provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding your expectations and simplifying your life. Coriant has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Coriant has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Coriant has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of planning, 
planning, investing, lending, and money management disciplines. Leverage Corient's exclusive network of experts to craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex they may be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, connect with a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. That's C-O-R-I-E-N-T.com. Corient.com. I mean, the... the being sent to prison back then as now if you there was no reform stuff uh in i call them like universities yeah criminals right i mean you go in you weren't hard when you go in you're gonna be hard when you come out <laughs> and and, and huddy was hard and uh so he had a few altercations now that first altercation led to a skull fracture from a bottle being cracked over his head mm. Uh, Huddy was so tough that the fracture was not even discovered until many years later. Wow. Literally fractured his skull with a yeah, bottle, and he didn't away. even know it. Yeah, he just, you know, years later, they, they found that out. Now, in his second altercation, he was playing a bar when he was attacked by a man with a knife. And the man actually sliced half of Huddy's neck yeah. before uh, Huddy Ledbetter's girlfriend at the time fought the man off. This left Lead Belly with a pretty horrendous scar. Yeah. Look, medical right. back in those days. Right. It's it wasn't what it is now. Cosmetic surgery. To yeah. The scar. yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're a former yeah. prisoner. Right. I mean, right. you know, it's like, give me some thread and you put yeah. four stitches yeah. and hopefully it'll stop bleeding. So the third altercation is one that really got him in trouble. And that took place while in Louisiana. So after a fight in which he claimed that six men tried to steal whiskey from his lunch pail, mm. uh, right. <laughs> you always yeah, have that in your yeah, lunch yeah, pail, yeah. uh, Lead Belly was convicted of assault with a t- intent to commit murder. Now, court records show that he was convicted of assaulting a white Salvation Army officer with a knife at a Salvation Army concert after the officer told Lead Belly to stop dancing to the music. Huh. So in 1930, Lead Belly gets sentenced to 10 years at Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. And authorities discovered, or after they discovered, his prior conviction for murder, he was disqualified from, for any chance of early release. Right. So they basically said, you're yeah. sentenced to 10 years, you're going to serve all 10. Years, yeah. So as you can imagine, life at that time, what we told you earlier, it wasn't easy in bloody Angola. And Lead Belly uh, will receive some pretty harsh beatings from the staff at that time for pretty minor offenses. But he adapted to the conditions in Angola, and eventually he was allowed to work as a laundryman and a, and a waiter. So he yeah. would actually wait on the staff on right. the staff of the prison. Uh during his prison term, it was interesting uh, in the research to find out he had the habit of sleeping uh, with the lights on even when he left prison. Really? Like he could not sleep Sam with the coming. lights off. Yeah. Um, in Angola, not much more is known except for that Ledbetter worked, he conned, and he fought to survive. Um, one story suggests that uh, Leadbelly was attacked by another inmate and stabbed in the neck for the second time in his mm. life. Other inmates who witnessed that fight said Lead Belly pulled the knife from his neck and returned the attack almost killing the assailant. Wow. Yeah. Hardcore. Let me tell you, if I stab someone yeah. in the neck and they pull it out the neck, start yeah. coming at me, I, I'd have messed up. Right. And I'm sure they knew that. Um, the fighting continued in Angola up until the day when Lomax discovered him in 1934. Yep. And so... Y'all, you know, when Lomax heard about him and then, you know, you got to hear the king of the 12-string guitar and all that. Um, so, I mean, Lomax loved it, right? And and he developed a plan to have Ledbetter record a song about Governor O.K. Allen. And Lomax, I mean, obviously they recorded. And y'all know there was no studios. They, it's like the old record players that did the reverse thing, right? The, uh but they, they recorded it, and he sent it to the governor along with a letter uh, that you know, asking, hey, governor, look how talented this dude is. Can you can you show him some mercy, give him, give him some clemency? And Governor Allen liked it so much that he was like, shit, 
this dude is is wasting his talent. And, and he released him, y'all. The <laughs> Governor Allen was like, I mean, this is this is impressive, impressive, and Lomax is, is advocating for him. And you know, we'd hate to see if somebody could play like this and sing like this because look, he was supposed to be the best ever at the time, but you know, he got out. And basically, he he sung his way out of prison for the second time. Cause remember second we, time, I mean, he did it to the, for for the governor in Texas, right? But Lead Belly wasn't done with his problems and mm. getting into trouble just yet, y'all. And in 1939, Lead Belly was arrested for assaulting a man with a knife. Uh-huh. Right. Again, That's right. how he handles his problems, and y'all. He stabbed the man. 16 times killed right? him good right killed him good so but i don't know that the guy died but um let let belly was convicted of third degree assault and he was sentenced to less than a year in prison <laughs> must not have been a very good victim right <laughs> the uh the estimated and well it he was around 51 years old at the time, y'all, and he began serving his fourth prison sentence in 1939. And by 1940, after serving eight months, he was released, and he, he traveled up to New York City. Right? New York City? New York City. And about this time, a folk music company was uh, you know, an up-and-coming thing in New York City, and it just absolutely exploded and had tremendous growth during and after World War II. Because y'all got to remember, that's kind of how the music was. Right? Yeah. Right? It was a big deal. That's right. Uh, uh, you know, swing music and what have you. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and uh, Alan Lomax, uh, again, the one who, who recorded and sent him to Governor O.K. Allen, uh, he helped Lead Belly with his legal fees in exchange for being able to record an album up because he knew yeah that it was a shit yeah and look Lomax it, you know it sounds like oh he's such a nice guy he's helping yeah, out Lead Belly yeah. he ain't a nice guy yeah. he's trying to use Lead Belly those people are still getting paid off of Lead Belly <laughs> that's right and you know so he did he helped him with those legal fees and the rest is history y'all Lomax took Lead Better on the road and he became absolutely one of the most famous blues and folk musicians of all time now five years after leaving bloody angola he was singing in carnegie hall imagine that you go from the world's worst prison to singing in carnegie hall 10 years later he was singing in paris he cleaned up his act and was known as one of the sharpest dressers in music. Uh, he, he's, Something he was kind of known styling, for. Right? Yeah. The, you know, I'm known as the sharpest dresser in podcast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, Lemax may appear, as I said, to be a savior to old Lead Belly. But uh, it said Lead Belly often had to perform menial tasks for Lone Max. He would shine his shoes and do his laundry. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. You know, this lot. guy singing in Paris and then shining the shoes of, right. his, of, of his manager. Yeah. Lone Max also took two thirds of Lead Better's earnings as his cut for managing and promoting him. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, sadly, y'all, Loma, well, sadly, maybe some people may say, hey, he's a murderer. Lead Belly died, but he died of ALS, Lou yeah, Gehrig's yeah, disease. Crazy. Just a horrible, awful way to, to go. Um, that was on December 6th of 1949. They estimate him to be around 60 years old at that time. Yeah. Um, and it was ironic that eight months after Lead Belly's death, his biggest hit surfaced, a song he opened his concerts with for years, and it was entitled Good Night, Irene. And I'm sure a lot of people uh, have heard that song. My mother used to sing me that song when I was a baby to go to sleep. Uh, the song was re-recorded by a band called The Weavers. That's uh, that's how it was discovered eight months after his death. And the title sold over two million copies. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot. lot during that time. Back then, yeah. So you may wonder what was some of his most popular songs. Uh, Good Night Irene, obviously, uh, would be the top. Midnight Special was another one. 
Where did you sleep last night? Yep. Another one I, I remember that song. The House of the Rising Sun. Yep. Imagine that. that Pick one. a bale of cotton. Yep. Was one. Yep. And Black Betty. Yeah. Well, let me, let me tell you a couple more real quick. I am. This is how Low Max made money. And the, you know, it's just some of these are crazy, y'all, but the, the, they are his songs. Um, Good Morning Blues or, or I Ring Good Night, like you said, Midnight Special. Here's one. Well, the, you know, World War II song, obviously. It's named the Hitler song. The Hitler the song. The Hitler song. And wow. I have it right here. I should play, I should play it. Then the um, the Bow Weevil. That's the the Bow Weevil, the, the bugs, uh, yeah. The Bugs and Cotton, yep. right? Bring Me a Little Water, Sylvie. Um, there is a man going around taking names. Uh, <laughs> take a whiff on me. Take a whiff on right? you. <laughs> Black Betty. Yeah. Alabama Bound. Cotton Fields. The Bourgeois Blues. Yeah. And when I was a cowboy, the Gallus Pole, looky yonder, Black Betty, and like you said, let it shine on me, and then ha ha this way, and we're in the same boat, brother. Black girl, Rock Island line, they hung him on the cross. A little religious music. Looky looky yonder, bring a little water, Sylvie. Yes, I was standing in the bottom. John Hardy, Scottsboro Boys. And the Mr. Hitler again, and then the Gallows song. Yeah. So, and if you notice those titles, y'all, those are are things he experienced in his right, life. Right, right, so right, right. Well, it's they, not like now where you the, have someone write your that's song. That's what the blues is about. Yeah. If you ever listen to it, it's about the the pain and the uh, in in the stories about life. And I always love the blues, by the way. I do, me as well, and. Uh, and he was one of the best at it. Yeah, he wrote all his own music. And in 1988, y'all, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Fame. Yeah. Uh, and that is the story of Lead Belly. Yeah. It'll be uh, pretty amazing. His music lives on. Uh, it sure does. Super, super cool. And it's talking about loving the blues. I used to go to, to Tavis Blues Box. It yeah. was downtown Baton Rouge in like the rough, rough part of town. Yeah. But he was one of my daddy's clients. And every time I'd go in with my friends, you know, he, he'd have me sit at his table and stuff like that. And B.B. Uh, King, all these guys, all these guys came around, um, you know, after Lead Belly. Yeah. And, and just – Either you love it or you hate it, I guess. And a lot of uh, a lot of them were inspired by right, his right, music, right. and that's it, it. All grew from that, really. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. what an uh, awesome guy he was, as far as his music's concerned. Yeah. But uh, not a very nice guy outside of that, <laughs> right. <laughs> according uh, to the history. Anyway, time coming up on his history, and yeah. Else. That's he right. lived his life and died from ALS. That's crazy. Yeah, I get him any other way. Yeah. The, um. The, I wonder how, you know, the, like the king of the 12-string guitar, think about that, how hard it is to play a 12-string guitar. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. that's some but – And, and but pretty, I mean, his uncle taught him when he was younger, but I'm sure right. he mastered it, you know, yeah. kind of self-taught. Right. And just a, a lot of people how he made his can just play by ear. And right. my my daughter plays the flute like yeah, no nice other. Right. And uh, – and she can just pick it up and play. Yeah. It's a, it's pretty amazing. She it's can write game. her own music, and yeah. some people just have that talent, man. If you put me behind a guitar, I I, I, I can strum it. it. That's yeah, about it. Yeah, <laughs> lead belly. And uh, we'll bring y'all some more on them. Uh, Jim and I are going up to Bloody Angola soon yeah, yeah. For, for a tour, and I know they have you know stuff on him in the museum and stuff like that. But the uh, interesting, interesting. You know, I think back to what you were saying about Camp D mm -hmm. and the women being housed there. And uh, I told you my, I, I know I said this before, but my grandfather was the first parole officer to live on the B-line. When, when he was there, my grandmother actually served as a correctional officer over women. Oh, and wow. So it would have been Camp D. Crazy thing is, uh, Camp D, when I went to the academy at Angola, mm. Camp D is where we lived. And we lived in a dormitory, just like the convicts, that five days a week, you got to go home on weekends. Yeah. Um, you get up in the morning. I always took, take my showers in the morning. Get up in the morning, shower, go eat breakfast with the convicts, 
with in, the convict in the convict mess hall. Yeah, you know, it was mostly trusty camp. Uh, yeah, uh, by the end, but you eat you eat right there at the tables with the convicts. How was the food? It was. Yeah, I I never had a problem with the prison food. Really? I mean, I, I actually thought shit was pretty good. Especially <laughs> when, really? Especially you no, know, yeah, but you, you know, I'm single and twenty years old or twenty one years yeah. old or whatever. And I'm getting three hots and a cot. Yeah. Uh, and the dormitories, are, you know, remind me years later when I was in the military, or a couple of years before when I was in the military, you know, just you walk in, it's this massive room with these steel bunks. Yeah. And, and you had your locker at the bottom, just like the convicts did. Wow. And where you put your stuff in, and you go to class all day long wow. uh, uh, in the same building. And shit, the convicts are just walking around freely. And what was what were they teaching in the class? Everything from CPR to um, how to look out for suicides to doing counts, you know, how to look out for um, contraband, how to do searches and seizures and yeah. just the anything you could think of that – you would have to do or possibly come in contact with um, as a correctional officer. Uh-huh. Everything from sex and don't do it with the inmates and shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, how it was a different society and culture when you went through those gates, and it is. Yeah. I told you the air doesn't even smell the same. Yeah. And, uh, um, the, just the history and, and everything else. I'm sure it's similar to like. Uh, y'all, when you walk into um, to this studio where we actually actually record the room, I, I get told all the time for people that have never been here. When I shut that door, you can actually feel the air. Right. It almost feels like it's airtight. Yeah, it does. It, it's a whole different sound. I would imagine when you describe the smell, it's very mm-hmm. similar. Well, you it's hit so- the smell. You hit a cell block or or a dorm. Yeah, you know, the dormitories. Like when you walk in the bathroom. There, there's no private stalls. It's half walls, and you literally, if I'm sitting here taking a shit and you're next to me, I can say, hey, Joe, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> there's no privacy in the showers or anything yeah. like that. There's no privacy anywhere. Yeah. You know, you're being watched all the time. Wow. Um, you know, it's just it's just a different way. I mean, go to, like, basic training for the Army, but they teach you basic Army stuff. Yeah. How to be a soldier. Um to law enforcement academy to become a police officer, they teach you the basics of being a cop. Right. When you go to the correctional, and, I, and I'm assuming it's still there, the uh, academy, that's what it was yeah. uh, at Angola, they taught you everything, the basics of what you needed to know to be a correctional officer to survive. But the one thing they also taught you, just like they taught, you in, um, taught me in the law enforcement academy at LSU, when you graduate and you go get that on the job training, yeah, they, they tell you forget about everything you just fucking learned. Yeah, because <laughs> now I'm going to teach you what the real shit's about. <laughs> right? So yeah, this is how it really works. That's body. right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, that's exactly what they do. But shout out to those people to get it done, especially the trainers who, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, usually the most senior people in uh, who've risen it. Throughout their career and sure. make a name for themselves, and and they go in there and have the time and the patience to teach these other people. Because even in law law enforcement, the and I hate to say this, but yeah, you, you know, some ninety nine percent of the best people, then you just got some fucking morons. Yeah, you every you profession, with, and you're like, you, you know, this dude's gonna get it swung. He's not gonna make it, and, yeah, right? And, and, or they're gonna be bringing in dope. You see all these correctional officers getting arrested all the time for bringing in dope and cell phones or having sex with inmates and shit like yeah. that. But, um, yeah, you got that, unfortunately, in every profession. And yeah. you, you mentioned CPR, and it just reminded me of something, because my wife has to get recertified every year. And we were talking about this the other night. Uh, you know, I try to stay up with it, obviously. I, I have her teach me. I right. just don't. I'm not technically certified. Yeah. But um, it has changed so much in the last 20. It used to be like seven to one. Yeah, you know, you right. do seven compressions to one breath. Y'all, now it's like 30 to one. Man, that's crazy because uh, uh, yeah. I, I saw that they had changes in that. The major. Not I mean, only CPR, but it'd be like first aid. I'll tell you what, one of the ones that's popping my mind now, what to do during a riot. Uh, um, mm. And the first thing, when they, if they took you hostage, you would try to put a human face on yourself, say, hey, 
I have a family, I have a wife, I have kids, whatever. And, you know, try to bring out the humanity in the person who was, who was kidnapping you or right. holding you hostage all the way up to the point. If you were getting fucking going to get raped, they, the, the very last resort, guess what it was? What? Shit on yourself. Try to shit or, or piss on yourself <laughs> to stop them to turn really? off from raping you. Yeah, yeah. this is shit. And they make you sign a thing stating or and um, law enforcement to you, stating that they tell you uh, like on the first day, if you can't kill a motherfucker, you're in the wrong room. And and you yeah. had to sign a form using that you stating that you were willing to use deadly force if necessary. Even if you know, in the tower, motherfuckers running, you fire the warning shot and then then you shoot to stop, but you might kill them, right? Right. But if you were a correction officer and you were taking somebody down to charity hospital in New Orleans and they ran in the city, you didn't have to fire the warning shot. Yeah. You just shot them. Mm. And, and so uh, I, and I saw one of Burl Kane's interviews. He was like, well, yep, yeah, you know, they got to fire the warning shot and then they got to shoot to stop them, but – Who's to say where they're going to hit them at with a, with a shotgun? You yeah. Know? So, like you say, there's just all kinds of crazy shit. And people think don't think about correctional officers like that on that scale, but they really are trained. And, and it, they have professionals in there. That's their life career. And they've been doing it for generations. And that, not just in there drawing a paycheck, but of course, you have some shitheads that are. Uh, uh, Always. But shout out to them because you know what? If they, they didn't do it. I mean, I, hey. You go in that motherfucking gate, and you're in there. You're outnumbered however many hundreds to one. You've got no weapon. Yeah. You, you've got nothing but your training and your experience. And I'm going to tell you something, and anybody who says different is, is, doesn't know what they're talking about. Convicts run a prison. Yeah. And, and it's all about simply if, if they ever got together in any given moment, and it has been proven by past rights, et cetera, if they ever – ever to come together as one collective mind, mm-hmm. they turn that motherfucker out. There's not a prison in in this world that can't be taken over. Yeah. Yeah. But convicts, there's a convict inmate, convict, this person who's down for a long time, they don't want to buck the system. They like their routine. They like their privileges and stuff like that. Yeah. And they don't want to fuck anything up. Right. Yeah. And they, so they're the ones that kind of keep the smooth, even kill and thing. Now, inmate, these young bucks that come in and always fighting and fucking and, and dealing with the dope and fighting guards or COs and stuff like that. And then, like we said before, you, you can do your time or let your time do you. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And and uh, those correctional officers, even though they're uh, they're not behind bars, they pretty much are. Should I mean, they're are, working these long I shifts. I felt like I was I was doing time with them. Yeah. yeah, and twelve hours on, twelve hours off, and look, no, I mean, twelve on, twelve on, twelve off, twelve off, twelve on three times, twelve off two times, and then twelve on three times, right? Yeah. And, and it, but never, it, they were always shorthanded. Uh, they had an on call list that came out every two weeks, whatever it was. And if your fucking name was on the on call list, you were get, you were going to call it in. You could just book on it. I didn't mind when I was young because I was fucking making a killing, right? Yeah. The, um, which would mean they were making more than probably minimum wage uh, back when I was doing it. But you, it got to the point where I hadn't had a day off in months. That I know they tell them sign me up. And the only way you can uh, could not go in was in any. You know, should even a young man likes to have his time off and they're not married and running the streets, et cetera. But they, they call and you say, Hey, you know what? Sorry, I'm fucked up. <laughs> and they, they, that's what I, I did. And it, or swim did. Uh, um, and so I'm fucked up. And he said, what do you mean? So I, I'm sorry. I've been drinking. <laughs> and I can't drive in. Right. And if, cause if they tell you then that you got to drive in, actually yeah. an old timer told, taught me that trick. So they tell you that you got to drive in then and you get in a wreck. And so yeah. Now. Yeah. Now, what he's saying, not saying he's lying. He, he probably was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably was. Yeah. Or I want it to be. Yeah. 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 And then, as you you know, and and you don't think about that with not only your correctional people, but your law enforcement officers in general is yeah. you kind of always on call because you always it seems like you're always shorthanded. Uh, you know, especially these days, mm-hmm. and these guys, a lot of them like to hunt. Yeah. You know, right. you you yes. might be in a tree stand and right. 
Right. And your phone's oh, fuck, going I'm ahead. I'm ahead. I can't tell you how many times I've been hunting or fishing or whatever. And that fucking pager goes off. I used to be a pager. Yeah. Pager goes off and then, you, then you're fucking done. Well, you especially when in. you're a detective. Yeah. Yeah. That was even worse. Uh, guaranteed you any time there was a holiday or an anniversary or a birthday, anything that meant something to you yeah. or graduation in your personal life. Some fucking asshole was going to kill somebody <laughs> or rape somebody, and you're getting called out. You're getting so called out. One of the reasons I went to the state police because they that was probably the biggest enticement for me was they said, "Look, you come over as a criminal investigator, you'll have no more of your own cases, no more nights, no more weekends. You know, yeah, yeah. You only get sent out if somebody else requests help. Right. So, and how many detectives when you were at the LPSO? How many? detectives you have at Livingston we had eight detectives for everything from theft of a garbage can to murder really everything wow that's and, surprising and now they have Jason Art has uh, just divisions and divisions like burglary yeah. units and major crime units and whatever the fuck they got they got a detective for everything now or a division which is great yeah and, well and, it and, keeps you guys from getting fucked. burned out we got and, fucked and, and it's not really greatest fault but and, and his daddy was the sheriff for him but they he was he was never a detective now jason r came up and he he served his time in detective too yeah so he understands the pressure of it every report they got written in by every deputy in the whole parish got referred to a detective yeah, wow. every day you walked in, they hey, you had a fucking stack of your reports like this. You know what you did? You read read it. It had the fence on top and whatever. If they didn't have a suspect, put that motherfucker in the round file. Oh, <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, you didn't even call them back. It yeah, that mean you got it today. And correction officers the same way. I mean, shit. That was well, you know, they got their own investigators. They they, they they that's it's just like a police force almost. Yeah. And, and, and you know, search teams, cert teams like, or like the SWAT teams and, and all that. So well, it's, it's come such a long way yeah. since, uh, since your time there and just the funding, yeah. uh, for, for, uh, police departments, uh, overall has, has increased so much, thankfully. Yeah. And you're able to hire more and more detectives because it mm. look, burnout is what leads to cases not getting solved. Sometimes yeah. you yeah. just, you can't right. do them all to the consistency that you want to do them in because there's so many and there's only a limited amount of you people know, investigating. You know, I used to say, um, Squeak wheel gets the grease. Yeah. And my fucker didn't call in and ask about the case. I, I mean, yeah. And that's a true, and, that's and, a true statement. If you didn't have a suspect, then, then, then I don't have time to fuck with it. Yeah. Right? Now, anyway, store for another day. Very interesting. Very interesting. But, well, that'd be interesting. The y'all, his music's online. You, you can YouTube it and do whatever. Yeah. Check him out. I'm going to listen to the Mr. Hitler song. <laughs> see what he had to say. I'm about definitely Hitler. curious <laughs> yeah. to hear that one uh, for sure. And Bull Weevil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's got to be Not a good picking one. Picking cotton in the field. Yeah. Hey, um, well, thank you to all our patrons. Yeah, obviously. yeah. I was about to say, patrons, we love y'all and you make this show run. We appreciate it. We will be getting you another episode coming up. I got some of them I'm looking at. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you're not a patron member, you want to be, you get all these locked up bonus episodes and all these different things, uh, um, perks and benefits according to the different tier levels. But go to patreon.com and type in bloody Angola or. That's right. And, and, yeah, you can get a pay or Apple uh, podcast, Apple podcast connect. Right. Yeah. You that is uh, Apple podcast is weird. They they're not like patron in that they don't have tier levels, right. but you will get early release episodes. Early, early commercials. It commercial releases. free yeah. um on on that platform so if if apple's your thing check that out if patrons your thing check that out yeah. uh uh got some monthly gifts going out here pretty soon uh so those go out to our warden team members which is the top tier level we we send them something uh quarterly yeah. so that quarterly gift will be heading your way soon i'm just waiting for it to get made yeah. uh so uh well Thank you very much to all of y'all. and appreciate each and every one of y'all. That's right. And until next time, I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Everton. Your host of Bloody Angola. Podcast, 142 years in the making. Complete story of America's bloodiest prison. Peace. Peace.
Just ask the hill string gang, Rango. 